what is up youtube welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then just welcome to my channel go ahead and subscribe because you will not be disappointed this video as you can tell by the title is another true crime and makeup video where i'm going to do this here good old fall look this pumpkin spice inspired look and tell you a very interesting and unfortunately true crime story today's video is the 44 day horror story of junko furuta and the crazy psychotic deranged group of young men who performed unspeakable terrible acts on her if you enjoy these types of videos and if you enjoy true crime i have a whole playlist i'm here for you to satisfy that need okay i will link it below or you know put it in the i card somewhere check it out so if you haven't you know go back and check out the last video the last video was of dennis nelson's old nasty ass okay where he was chopping folks up and putting them in the floorboards and doing all kind of crazy things with corpses hey I don't make the news, I just report it, okay? Without further ado, let's just get into the video. Junko Furuta was born April 30th, 1970. She grew up with both her parents in the house, a younger brother and an older brother. And for the most part, she had a pretty typical childhood. No trauma, no craziness. She grew to be a rather normal, typical teenager. She had good grades, she wasn't in any trouble. She just, you know, she just went to school and she had a part-time job, all the normal stuff, right? She was said to be very pretty and to be quite popular in school. And she seemingly had a bright future ahead of her. That is until she met Hiroshi Miyano, a fellow student who was an asshole. He was known to be a school bully. I'm going to call him Hiroshi for the rest of the video, his first name, because Somebody else has a similar name and I don't want to confuse y'all. Hiroshi was a well-known school bully and he also was known to have connections to the Japanese mafia. And he would always brag about that and, you know, just use that as leverage to get his way, get people to do what he wanted them to do. Now, Junko being this, you know, this hot young thing with a bright future, <laughs> Hiroshi just, he couldn't resist. He developed a crush on her and he pretty much shy his shy one day. And she was just like, no, she wasn't down. She wasn't attracted to him. She turned him down and he did not take that well. You know, men don't take rejection well. They don't. I'm gonna tell you a short story right quick. I was at a store, a convenience store with my sister one time years ago, my younger sister. And this guy, he was holding the door and he acted like such a gentleman. He was holding the door and when he walked through, he was like trying to get her attention. He was like, She's so rude. She doesn't talk to strangers. Like, it's kind of embarrassing sometimes, Melissa. I'm so sorry about this, but it is. Literally, we can be in the mall and somebody's like, hey, ladies, how are you doing? And she will not say anything. She's like, I don't, I don't talk to strangers. My girl. Literally, they're not alluring you with candy. They're just saying hello. So, anywho, she does not respond to the guy. And then he's like, I know your big head ass hear me. And I'm just like, we, you know, men, they don't like to be rejected. Hurts their little pride. Hiroshi was not happy about the rejection rejection he received from Junko, and that's there's that. You know, according to classmates, nobody had ever rejected him before because they were afraid. Like I'll be damned if I date somebody because I'm scared not to. Fast forward to a few days later, it's November twenty fifth, nineteen eighty eight. <laughs> the year God blessed the world with a very special girl. Hiroshi and Minato, one of his delinquent ass friends, are kicking it in a park. Like, they were experienced gang rapists and they were pretty much looking for a victim already. Like, they're just looking for somebody's life to ruin. Lo and behold, here comes Junko on her bike on her way home from work, and it's like 8 30. It's after work, she's on her way home. So Hiroshi devises his plan. He's like, hey, go kick her off her bike. I'm gonna step in like, you know, I'm breaking up the scene and we'll go from there, right? So that's what they do. Minato approaches her, kicks her off her bike and then he just takes off. And so then Hiroshi, the classmate, he comes out of nowhere. He's like, oh, I saw that. He helps her up and he's just like, that's awful. Do you want me to escort you home? Now, although he's known to be a bully, right? He's also a familiar face. So to some degree, there's a level of trust that she has for him. She takes the offer. 
or you know Hiroshi to give her a safe escort home and unfortunately she never makes it home. Hiroshi leads her to an abandoned building instead where he rapes her and he threatens her with his connections to the Japanese mob. He's like if you make a sound I will have them kill you and your family and so she's just thinking okay if I could just get through this you know everything will be okay let me just endure he then takes her to a park where three more of his friends are waiting including the one that knocked him off the bike or knocked her off the bike sorry so they all rape her as well and Ooh, I fucked up my bro. After the boys rape her, smuggle her into Minato's home. And this unfortunately was just the beginning. Now mind you, I said she got off work at 8.30. So fast forward, it's like a couple hours later and her parents are worried. They're like, where is my child? And when she doesn't return home after a couple of hours, they report it to the police. Now the boys knew that this might be an issue. Like they expected the parents to report her missing. And so to get ahead of that and avoid like a whole manhunt, they have Junko call home and tell her parents that she had run away and that she was with a friend and she was safe. Like, don't come looking for me. I'm fine. I just ain't coming back. And the parents believe it. And so they call off the search. Now, whenever Minato's parents are around, they force her to act as if she was his girlfriend. So for a while, they thought that, you know, that this was just his, their son's girlfriend hanging around at the house all the time. But that only lasted for a little while because soon after that, his parents began to grow suspicious that, you know, something wasn't right. Like, maybe this girl is being held here against her own will. But when they questioned him about it, he was pretty much like, mind your motherfucking business. And so they were like, we was just asking. Minato's parents actually kept their heads down for 44 days and lived in an alarming ignorance as to what was going down in their own home like the horrors so over the course of the next 44 days yes 44 44 days the boys would repeatedly rape junko they would invite other boys from the neighborhood over to also like rape and torture her. They inserted iron bars, scissors, skewers, firecrackers, and even a lit light bulb into her vagina and anus. And like I said, this went on for 44 days. So eventually like completely destroyed her anatomy. She was not in the end. She wasn't even able to control her bowels. When they were not torturing her, they of course starved her. They forced her to eat live cockroaches. They forced her to masturbate in front of them and drink her own urine. Yeah, her body was hung from a ceiling and then they would beat her with bamboo sticks, iron rods, like golf clubs, pretty much anything that you would swing at a fucking pinata. Her eyelids and her genitals were burned with cigarettes, lighters, and hot wax. They even tore off one of her nipples and pierced the other one with a sewing needle. Now listen, I've had my nipples pierced before. And I'm telling you, by a professional, that shit is just nothing to play with. So I cannot imagine having some stupid, young, dumb teenagers doing it. You think you've been through some shit and then you hear somebody else's story. This went on for 44 days, y'all. 44 days. The parents did nothing. They actually later stated that they didn't intervene because they were aware of their son's Japanese mafia connections and fear retaliation they said that their son had their own son had become increasingly violent toward them he was they were afraid of him and his friends Manato also had a brother who was aware of what was going on he also lived in the house and he also did nothing i'm guessing he was scared to still like come on people people come on Twice the police were alerted to Junko's conditions and what was going on, and both times they failed to intervene. The first time, a boy who was invited over, he said he was bullied into raping her. We gonna take that as the truth. He said he was bullied into raping and like torturing her. And it like disturbed him so much that when he returned home, no, he didn't call the police, y'all. He told his big brother. His big brother was like, what? 
and so he told his parents who contacted the police. Police arrive and Minato's parents is like, what girl, there's no girl here, like, we don't know what you're talking about. They even offered the police to come in and take a look inside and walk around. And the police felt like, you know, if, if they had a girl in here and if this was really going on, why would they invite us in? Like, so the invitation alone was enough to persuade the officers that, you know, hey, nothing's going on here. There's nothing to see here. After everything went down, both officers received a considerable amount of backlash, as they should have. Had they done their damn job, her torture would have only lasted 16 days instead of 44. And she probably would have been able to not, you know, be rescued and come back from her injuries. But instead, the two officers failed to follow procedure. And so because of that, they were both fired. The second time the police were called, Junko had actually gotten a phone and was able to dial 911 herself but before she could say a word the boys discovered her hung up the phone when the police called back they were like you know it's just a misdial ain't nothing happening and the dispatcher with i mean of course she believed them why wouldn't she now this upset them of course a whole great deal they got pissed off and to punish her they cover her legs and feet in lighter fluid and lit her on fire they also shoved a large bottle into her anus causing severe bleeding she reportedly went into convulsions and the boys thought that she was faking it so this enraged them because they thought she was faking a seizure and they light her on fire again she survived these injuries and later in trial one of the guys testified that at this point she just started to beg them like please just kill me get it over with and they refused they continued to torture beat her rape her sodomize her and eventually because of this she lost all control of her bowels and so she would start to urinate and defecate on herself and then when this would happen they would beat her for that these motherfuckers gonna bust hell like they gonna bust hell wide open I'm convinced. The brutality of the attacks left her appearance like severely altered. Her face was so swollen it was difficult to like make out her features and she was just unrecognizable after all these weeks of all this abuse and torture. Her body was severely crippled to the point that it began to give off a rotting smell and this turned the boys off sexually from her. So now that they can't rape her anymore, they're upset and they start to abuse her even more, but apparently they can't get no voluntary vagina. And so they kidnap a 19 year old to satisfy their rapey needs who was also on her way home from work when they caught her in the park just like Junko. January 4th 1989 almost two months after they pick up Junko they force her to play them in a game of Mahjong right she wins and if you haven't realized now these boys have the most fragile toxic masculinity known to man and so their egos cannot take being beaten by a woman in a game they become enraged, they beat her, and then torture her to the point of death. Afraid of being charged for murder, they wrapped her body up in blankets and placed her in a suitcase and then put her body in a 55 gallon drum, filled it with wet cement, and then tossed it into a cement truck over in Tokyo. So remember the 19 year old girl that I said that they kidnapped and raped to satisfy their little nasty rapey needs? Well, two weeks after they disposed of Junko, Hiroshi and one of the other guys, Joe, is arrested on that charge because, you know, the police decided to finally do their job. During Hiroshi's interrogation, the police told them about a, an, an open murder that they were investigating. They convinced him that his friend has already confessed and ratted him out and so he's thinking that they're talking about Junko and he confesses and tells them where he can find her body and the murder case that they were asking about actually had nothing to do with Junko they had no clue that she had been murdered to their knowledge you know she had run away with a friend they were talking about somebody else so he turned himself in for nothing within a couple days all four boys were arrested and in custody all of them were still under 18 which helped them out a lot they did however have to you know go through the go through the process of having a trial and all of that and it said that the details of the case and like the torture that they you know that i just told you guys was, was so much that people were literally fainting in court 
June Girl's mother also sadly has suffered a mental breakdown herself and she had to have psychiatric treatment. I mean, I imagine hearing those details for any parent would be just like a bit much. I'm pretty sure she felt some level of responsibility. Not responsibility, but some level of like regret for calling off the search and like believing that she had run away. But I mean, it's not her fault. I feel terrible for her. Like, mama, it's not your fault that motherfuckers are just horrible and deplorable human beings. Like, now despite their unspeakable torture of Junko, the boys received shockingly light sentences. People believe that their ties to the mafia helped them tremendously which I'm sure it probably did. Had it been heard anywhere else, or if the boys were like one or two years older, they would have been dealt capital punishments and not the little slaps on the wrist that they got. Hiroshi, her classmate who started it all, he was sentenced to 20 years, which that ain't a whole lot, but considering what everybody else got compared to that, like Minato, whose home she was stuffed away in, originally only received four to six years. <laughs> An appeal was done on his sentence he was resentenced to five to nine years which is not much better he was 16 at the time of the incident his parents and his brother weren't charged with anything like the parents should have been charged the brother should have been charged i don't care junko's parents sued monado's parents in a civil case the one that i don't know how much they ended up getting but they won when their son was released from prison he moved in with them and reportedly like never worked again. He just stayed at the house, allowed them to take care of him. Somebody needs to go check out the scene. That motherfucker might have somebody in there with him. You never know. His poor parents are probably just being, ugh, they're probably miserable living with him. Yeah, me fucked up. The other two guys, Yasushi Watanabe, I feel like, I feel like I'm ordering sushi. He was sent sentenced to five to seven years. He was 17 at the time of the murder and he was released when he was just 24 years old. He got out, got married, and went on to have a normal life like the one that they stole from old Junko. I just hate to hear that. I hate when somebody commits these horrible, deplorable, unspeakable crimes and then you hear, oh, and then they were released and went on to live a, a normal life. And it's like, really? After they took the life, took a life? And last but not least, Joe. Ogura. He served eight years in juvenile and was released in August 1999. He was 17 at the time of the murder, 25 when he was released. And when he got out, he actually was boasted around town about his involvement in the Junko incident. In 2004, he was arrested because he kidnapped and beat a man that he suspected his girlfriend was cheating on him with. He followed the man, he beat him for four hours, and he told him that he would kill him and get away with it because he'd done it before. He was sentenced to seven years for the assault and he has since been released. And his mother, she vandalized the grave of Junko saying that girl had ruined her son's life and if it had not been for Junko he would have grown up to be a great guy like girl I don't sound like he was a great guy from the start and bitch that's probably your fault because obviously you're stupid so that is pretty much it for this story and this look don't forget to give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it enjoyed it I feel bad like it's such a heartbreaking story so it feels wrong to say if you enjoyed it you know what I mean give it a thumbs up share it subscribe if you have not as always thank you so much for watching and i will see you in the next one peace